welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we undertake the painting and weathering of our ICM Liberty truck. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. In our part one build episode, we found a nicely detailed and cast kit. Ambiguities in the instructions and the lack of foolproof witness marks on some of the parts kept us on our toes throughout the build. Part fit overall was very good, however we did encounter some assemblies that tested our dexterity and patience. But despite the challenges, we managed to avoid most of the kit's landmines and our great war hauler was starting to take promising shape. So stick with us as we take our Liberty Truck project through to its grand finale. With our major sub-assemblies complete and the rest of our parts cleaned up, we were almost ready to start painting. The kit's engine looks great, but the instructions call for sealing it in with the engine covers. The Liberty has old-fashioned hinged hood leaves and they fold up to service the engine. The hood leaves that come in the kit are a single part with the hinge detail molded on. If we wanted to pick the cover in its open position, we'll have to cut the piece in two. Looking at the back of the panel, there's what appears to be a scored line, which at first I thought was molded there to help us make our cut. But if we look closely, the score line does not align with the molded on hinge line. Instead, I used masking tape and aligned its edge with the outside molded on hinge line. The tape gives us an accurate line to guide our cut. We tape the piece firmly onto our mat so it stays put while we're cutting. We then use a straight edge aligned with the tape line. We make several shallow cuts, pressing lightly on our blade. We want to avoid pressing hard to ensure our cut is straight and so we don't crack the piece. We can sand the edge gently to clean up the cut. The hood leaves butt up against the firewall and radiator and to ensure a tight fit, we'll paint our leaves first and we'll install them later once our cab and radiator are attached to the frame. We have to tackle one other issue before we can paint. In our build episode, we discovered rather nasty seams in the radiator. I didn't have the stomach to do a full perfect fill job, but we did commit to doing a light filling. There are also other places that could benefit with a light filling, like the tiny gaps where the oil lamps mount to the firewall, and the minute gaps here in the grab handles. For gaps like these, I like to use white glue. We squeeze out a bit of the glue and thin it with water so it flows off our brush. Here we're demonstrating how the glue is applied in our AVGP Grizzly build. Depending on how thin our glue is, we may have to apply several coats, allowing each layer to skin over before applying the next. White glue dries transparent so we don't see our results until we paint. Jumping ahead a little with our paint on, we see that the white glue does a decent job, especially in these areas where sanding is near impossible. And this is how the fine gaps in the oil lamps and grab handles look once painted and weathered. Some builders like to completely finish their models before painting them. I prefer building up some of the major sub-assemblies, but I do a lot of painting prior to construction. That gives me greater control and I don't have to worry about missing spots or trying to detail paint difficult to reach places later. There is no right or wrong way, use whatever method you prefer. We begin the process of mounting our parts on sticky side up masking tape. Our parts are held firmly in place while airbrushing, but we'll have to turn some parts over if they require paint on all sides. Here I flatten a bit of scrap sprue tree with sandpaper, and the cab was attached with a drop of CA glue. We start with a coat of flat black enamel. This layer acts as a quasi primer coat. It exposes imperfections so we can fix them before our final coat. And the enamel is durable, so if our acrylic rubs off during handling or weathering, we see black instead of raw plastic. We had a little Tamiya XF58 olive green acrylic left over from our Grizzly project. I decided to use it on our Liberty. I lightened the green with a little Tamiya XF60 acrylic. To thin the paint for airbrushing, I tried this Mr. Hobby leveling thinner. Our little circle template came in handy for masking our Liberty wheels. We can paint the spokes and rim green while masking off the black that we already laid down. Available at art stores, these inexpensive circle templates really come in handy for model airbrushing. We simply tape off the circle sizes that fit our model.
I've never seen color period photos of the Liberty, but ICM depicts the truck's seats as both canvas covered and leather. These restorations show canvas colored and black seats. The seat color is really a matter of choice, but I decided on a leather brown color. I used an old bottle of Model Master Rust Enamel for the base coat, and I oversprayed it with Tamiya Clear Orange. The cab canvas cover gets a coat of Tamiya XF49 Khaki Acrylic. Here the truck's engine is sporting its black enamel base coat. We can then spray the engine and all of our other parts with a clear gloss acrylic. I used Tamiya's X22 Thin with Mr. Color Leveling Thinner. On the wheels, I mask off the areas where we apply our model glue. You can use model glue on painted parts, but raw plastic is the best surface. This ensures we get a strong joint, and the slow setting time of a model glue lets us adjust the wheels as needed. This helps to get them straight when we install them on the frame. To weather our model, we use this light sienna pigment powder. We'll also use oil paints and colors left to right, burnt umber, black, white, brown, yellow ochre, sap green, and burnt sienna. We mix a light sienna color to match our pigment powder color. Yellow ochre, burnt umber, white, and a touch of sap green are used to get the tone. We separate a little of our light sienna colored oil and dilute it heavily with mineral spirits. We'll use this for our pin wash. We go around the model with our diluted light sienna pin wash. We pick out raised areas, seams, nooks, and crannies. Once the oil paint is sufficiently dry, usually when it turns dull, we gently blend the color with a large soft brush. We use a soft dabbing motion. We want to soften and blend the edges of the colored dabs. And here's the finished look once our pin wash is blended. The pin wash gives the engine that realistic, dirty, dusty look. The pin wash collects in the nooks just like dry dirt and mud coat real engines. The pin wash brings the radiator detail to life. And we can't forget to paint the raised USA stamping. Here I used red, white, and blue testers enamels painted on with a fine detail brush. I like to use a soft 9B pencil and a little Model Master aluminum enamel for detailing metal parts. We can rub the radiator's edges with our pencil and dry brush with our aluminum enamel. I also painted the radiator grill with a black wash to give it some contrast. We finish assembling the radiator. Then it's installed into the frame. The engine slips snugly into the frame without any issues. The flat black paint, gloss coat, pin wash, pencil swipes, and aluminum paint dry brushing all give the engine a very realistic look. There's a little bent pipe piece that gets inserted into the bottom of the radiator. Unfortunately, in all the excitement of the build, I managed to misplace this part. I had some styrene rod in my stash and luckily it was the right size. The rod is soft and pliable and we can easily bend it to the right shape. We install the rod replacement with CA glue and a little black paint completes the restoration. For the drivetrain and transfer case, I colored the parts with my soft graphite pencil to depict a raw metal look. We illustrated the technique here in our Tamiya Opal Blitz build. The parts are first sprayed with a flat black enamel. Then using our pencil, we simply color in the part. We press hard with the pencil to burnish the graphite on. We can then further polish the surface with a cotton swab. Our exhaust manifold and muffler get installed quite late in the assembly. These exhaust components, atop of their flat black enamel base coat, got some rust color pigment powders. We can also use some black oil paint and dab it on to replicate soot, oil and grease. And some of the edges get a swipe of our pencil. In order to add a little depth and variety to our Liberty's otherwise monochromatic paint scheme, we'll use dark colored oil paints. We mix a little burnt umber and black to achieve the tone. Then with a large soft brush and using very little paint, we go around the model and gently blend in dark patches. The area I'm working on here gets hidden once the seats get installed, so it's a perfect place to practice the technique before moving on to more exposed areas on the model. The dark patches break up the otherwise flat surface, creating variety and modulation. The dark areas also mimic shadows, dirt and grime buildup, and a worn metal look. 
And here's the look we're after. On the floor of the cab, I dry brushed a little aluminum enamel to depict worn metal where the passenger's feet would wear away the paint. A little burnt umber and burnt sienna are dabbed on to depict rust. Next, we add highlights using our light sienna colored oil mixed with a little white to lighten it. Again, we use very little paint, undiluted, and with a large soft brush, we gently dab on the color. We build up the color gradually and blend and feather it into the base coat. This again gives us variety and reproduces that faded panel look. And here's the look so far. The seats have very subtle creases sculpted into their surfaces, but otherwise they look very flat. We'll use a little oil paint to liven them up. We start by dry brushing burnt umber mixed with black on the seat edges. We gently blend and feather the edges. We also add the dark color to the depressions. And here's a look so far. We've already given the surface some depth, but let's accentuate it even further. Using a very light off-white oil color, we blend in highlights by dabbing paint onto the high spots. Again, we use very little paint, and using a large soft brush and a dabbing motion, we gently blend and build up the color. The effect is subtle, but I think we've done a good job of turning a relatively flat and bland piece into something that's visually interesting and realistic looking. The canvas cab cover gets the same treatment as the seats. We'll mix these oil paints to match the Tamiya acrylic khaki color that we applied earlier. And here are the colors on our palette. We mix red, green, and a touch of white to get the base khaki color. We can tint the khaki with black to get our shadow color, and tint the white to get our highlight color. So here's the Liberty's high-tech dashboard and has a single dial and its instrument panel. The kit doesn't come with an instrument dial decal, so I dug out this decal set from my stash. Luckily, it has a couple of dials in the right size. I dabbed a little clear gloss coat enamel over the decal to seal it in. The kit's oil lamps are solid pieces. The lamp faces are completely flat and featureless, and no clear lenses come in the box. I struggled with trying to figure out how to paint a perfect tiny circle to make the kit's lamps look a little more realistic and detailed. To solve this, we hollow out the lamps with a pin vise and a bit just smaller in diameter than the lamp housing. We must be careful to keep the bit centered so it doesn't slide off when we apply pressure. We barely penetrate the surface, keeping our hole as shallow as possible. And here's the look so far. Our holes are very shallow and we can see the raw gray plastic. We finish with a dab of silver enamel paint. We pick up a drop with a toothpick and carefully dab the glob into the hole. For the truck bed, I decided to pick the lightly worn and weather painted wood look. We start by dabbing black oil paint on edges where the metal brackets meet the wood slabs. We use very little paint and gently dab it on with a large soft brush. We build up the color gradually. We can then dab on more black and dark burnt umber on the edges of the boards. These areas are then blended and feathered. And here's the look so far with the shadows blended in. Next, we color the middle of the boards with a very light brown, almost gray color with oils. This light color is then blended. We continue the process adding paint and blending until we get the desired look. And here's the effect so far. For the next step, we go old school with dry brushing. We use an off-white creamy oil color, and with a wide stiff brush, we swipe raised edges. We don't see this technique used too often today, but it does a great job of making the details pop. The white frosting and dark shadows we added create depth and excellent contrast. With the parts painted, we can finally assemble the bed, which goes together effortlessly. Its fit atop the frame is equally well engineered. 
Our final steps included muddying up the vehicle's bottom with pigment powder fixed with alcohol. We covered this process in more detail in other build videos, so we'll fast motion through it here. The wheels were finished with our light sienna pin wash. We can then attach the wheels to the frame with thick CA glue. To finish the wheels we can paint over the black rubber areas with light sienna pigment powder heavily diluted in alcohol. This creates a nice dusty, road-worn look. We can add mud splashes using our undiluted light sienna oil color. Using a ratty brush with splayed bristles and applying the paint quite thickly, we press on irregular patterns on the lower edges. And here's the look we're after. The model has quite a few tiny and fidgety parts to install quite late in the build. The parking brake handle is a good example. When building this model, it would be much easier to install this part earlier in the assembly, before inserting the seats. These hood locks, which the instructions install almost at the end of the build, are challenging. Note their near microscopic size. There's no hole for them to insert into. Along with their tiny size and hard to reach placement, they were definitely a test for our patients and dexterity. To get the hood leaves installed, I applied a generous bead of glue on the inside hidden surfaces. The parts were then stuck together and allowed to tack up for a few minutes. I then gently bent the pieces to the proper angle and attached them to the firewall with a touch of thin CA applied with a micro brush. The ICM Liberty truck was a fun and fascinating project. Because of the many small parts, somewhat difficult assemblies, the at times unclear instructions, and the lack of idiot proof witness marks, this kit is therefore not recommended for novice or younger builders. But intermediate to advanced builders will have no problems getting great results. The casting detail is excellent and the part fit and overall kit engineering is generally very good, with noted exceptions. We also appreciate the various bed cover options that came right in the box. The model's spindly and rickety form, drab color, simple yet practical design nicely capture the primitive lines so characteristic of these early era war machines. And that'll do it for this episode. Check back soon for more unboxings, build, painting, and weathering videos. If you enjoy these programs, why not subscribe to the channel? Leave a like, dislike, share the video, or just grumble in the comments. Or stop by the channel Tom's World for a complete list of all our videos. In the meantime, keep your supply train running, stay well, and all the best.